a little windy outside. Who knows about the rain, but we're glad and thankful for the rain. It's good to be here with you all. A couple things to share, announcements live. I do remember, saw the signs up that uh, Badger Fire and Rescue Omelet Breakfast is happening this morning. Until uh, 11.30, it says here. But more information about that is in the insert. And then in uh, a week, uh, there is a, a, an event after Sunday school for students and adults to come along if they would like to at Fort Frenzy. And there's information about this Fort Frenzy fun event. Um, that is, is my microphone not working again? there? Is it on now? Okay. Okay. My, my, in my end it was on. There we go. That's a good thing. All right. Let's see. Where was I? Oh yes, the Fort Frenzy event. So, glad to uh, get to share that um, next week. And uh, what else? Looks like uh, Easter lilies are very nicely displayed here. A few of them were picked up this last week, and, and we'll keep them around for the service today, but I, I would guess that it's a good time to pick them up while you can still enjoy them at home. It's going to be a little bit interesting for communion. Of course, we don't like change, but we're going to be at the altar rail for communion, so you have to kind of negotiate. Those coming from this side have to find their way around and get to the altar rail. Um, just, I think you can do it. I think you'll figure out a way to do it. I don't think I need to have like direction lines uh, painted or with tape. I think you'll figure it out. All right. If you're, do we have any other announcements, I guess? No? Okay. I invite you to stand, if you're able. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And you can greet each other in God's peace.
Let us pray. Lord God, we gather together in this Easter season. It is the week after the Easter celebration, but we want to give you praise and thanks for the great miracle of your resurrection and what you gift to us in that with the promises of new life. Oh Lord, we bless you and know that you are the only help, the only one who can rescue us. We don't put our trust in things of this world. We put our trust in you. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Go ahead and be seated. The children are going to sing for us first. And then there's going to be a little children's message after that. Thanks, Brandon. Good morning. I just want to point out this group is a little more about the movement than the singing, so I hope you enjoy our two selections this morning. One more. Sorry. Okay. That had to be a change of seat. Yes.
behind us at these plants. Did you know there's an interesting story somebody made up, but it's kind of fun to think about, even though it's not an actual true story. But they said when Jesus rose from the dead and he left the tomb and he was walking around that all those places where he walked, beautiful Easter lilies were growing. Isn't that interesting? That they, they sprouted where his footsteps were. It's a story they made up, but it's kind of a fun, neat thing to think about just because they're beautiful, right? And beautiful things come from Jesus. So what other things could we think of, not just like a, a plant, but what other things would be beautiful that Jesus did? I can think, what did you think of? He gave people joy. Yes. What else are you thinking? Love and happiness. Yeah. He healed some people. That was pretty amazing and beautiful, too. And uh, you know what he did with kids? He said, come on, you're important. I welcome you. Be a part of my people. He, he made kids valuable. Instead of kids being, like, forgotten, like, get away, get away. He didn't do that at all. He said, let the, let the kids come to me. They're important. They're valuable. He loves them. And the other beautiful thing Jesus did is forgiveness. Forgiveness. So, Jesus is alive again. We keep celebrating that. It's every Sunday kind of celebration, but we're in the Easter season right now, so particularly we celebrate that. The beautiful flowers can remind us of beautiful things that Jesus did. Right? Nice. So let's have a prayer together. Let's have a prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. Thank you for beautiful flowers. And for all your beautiful love and forgiveness. Amen. Thanks so much, kids. Good morning. Bet you all didn't know that get up song's the first thing my wife sings to me every morning. <laughs> Without the actions, of course. Our first reading today is from the book of Acts, chapter 4. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Kind of an interesting concept. Uh, today, in the spirit of unity, we're going to read Psalm 133 in unison. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured out on the head, running down on the beard. 
running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Our second reading today is from 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it, and we testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We, we write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is the light, we have fellowship with him and with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and will just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we will make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the end of the reading. gospel reading is John chapter 20, starting at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. 
Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Go ahead. Be seated. Oh, it's so good to be here with you. I want to share with you a message this morning and just start it off by saying that we live at a time when people have doubts and doubts cause people to speculate and develop theories for why these doubts they have might be true. And one of the things I thought of to talk about just briefly was the U.S. astronauts landing on the moon. Some people doubt that it ever happened. People go into all kinds of doubts and conspiracy theories, but I want to leave with you some evidence of the actual moon landings. And first, the top two photos show a simple little square device that was left on the moon. And it's called, a very complicated name, it's called the uh, Lunar Laser Ranging Retro Reflector Array. Basically, it's, a, it's got a shiny surface on it, and if from Earth they shine a laser all the way to the moon, and then it bounces back to Earth, they can tell exactly down to the centimeter what the distance is from Earth to the moon. And it was placed there by Apollo 11 astronauts, astronauts uh, Aldrin and uh, Armstrong, and it, it's still functioning today. It simply wouldn't be able to tell that it takes 2.56 seconds for it to laser to go to the moon and back if we didn't have it there. And that tells us the distance exactly. A second piece of evidence is that there is something called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and it is a, as a satellite that flies in a low orbit, like 70 kilometers above the surface of the moon, and it can take photographs, and the photographs record such things as landing sites, um, the, the scent modules that, that they landed with on the moon, um, even dark squiggly paths away from a little center spot there are the astronauts' foot tracks as they walked on the moon. Not only have we been able to see it from our own photos from the, the reconnaissance orbiter, but other um, China, India, and Japan, other countries' spacecraft have taken photos and recorded these things as well. But people, you know, they don't want to believe evidence, so they spread a lot of rumors and cause a lot of doubt. So I bring all this up so that we can talk about the topic of doubt today from John's Gospel, from these encounters that Jesus has, from the disciples being impacted by Jesus being there, his resurrection. This gospel records these encounters of Jesus with these disciples. And so I want to talk about doubt and faith today. I also want to share with you that back when I was in high school, you know, in the other century that we used to live in, um, some, other, some others of you are even older than I am, but at least to some of the kids that are here today and even teenagers, so and I probably feel kind of old. But my Sunday school teacher was Mrs. Vera Grote, uh, Merlin Grote's wife in uh, Manson, and she was encouraging us as high school students to, to get rid of doubt and just believe. Get rid of the doubt. Maybe you're thinking that's an important thing also. Get rid of the doubt, just believe. But what we have in this um, verses today in John's Gospel, I would like to share with you. And to do that, I want to give a little clarification because one of the main characters is a fellow named Thomas. That's his nickname. Did you know that? Not his given name. Thomas is a, is a word that means twin. The, the Greek word didymus mentioned in that Bible reading means the same thing, twin. So it's not an actual name. It's just the nickname, Thomas. Why was he called Thomas? Why was he called twin? Well, it is pretty sure that he is actually a fellow named Jude, and Jude was the brother of Jesus. Evidently, he looked like his older brother, Jesus. So they called him twin, like you're twinning with your brother. Probably it was almost like a teasing kind of thing that they called him that. So he must have known two things about Jesus at least. One, that he was special, and one, that he was ordinary also. 
He was human and he was special. He was God, but probably he was remembering a lot about the fact that he was human. All the times that maybe his older brother teased him, who knows what kinds of things they got into when they were kids. But he was not there when Jesus appeared to his disciples, uh, came somehow around through in to the room. Doors were locked, but there Jesus was standing there. And Jesus showed the other disciples the evidence, the scars in his hands, the scar in his side where they had pierced him with the with the, uh, the big sharp, not the sword, what are we talking about? A spear, a spear. He showed them the evidence. He breathes upon them the Holy Spirit. He tells them, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. And so, must have been a few days later, they see this fellow Jude. And they tell him the situation. They say, we have seen the Lord. But Jude, otherwise known as Thomas, says, well, I need to see it firsthand. I need to see him. I need to be standing there too. And that kind of fits. It kind of fits. A lot of people today are much like this fellow Jude, or Thomas, as we call him. We have a phrase that a lot of people use. You've got to see it to believe it, right? Who, is, who has said that before? I've got to see it to believe it. Yeah, we do that. And skepticism is a pretty healthy thing in the day and age in which we live because there's a lot of scammers out there and we have to have some healthy skepticism about that because you can get taken uh, for money, you know. Uh, we also learn from bad experiences, you know, with, with business leaders and corporations and politicians and, and phone callers that, that want to scam you. So a little bit of doubt and healthy skepticism is good. You know, you don't want to be victims of a guy's name Ponzi or Madoff. But in regards to Christian faith, what place does doubt have? And I would say that a lot of Christians would call doubt the enemy. But I think if you'll listen to the rest of my message today, I want to demonstrate to you that doubt is not the enemy. It's been my experience in my years in, in ministry that faith and doubt are not opposites. Some people will say, there's faith, and the opposite of faith is doubt. But I, I don't believe that. I think there's faith in Jesus, and the opposite of faith in Jesus is faith in something else. Doubt's still over here on the side of faith with Jesus. Faith goes through a process similar to the maturing work that happens from childhood to adulthood. Similar, but not exactly the same. There are some stages that people go through in the physical and emotional maturing process from childhood to adulthood. Faith also goes through a process and stages as well. And one of these stages that I would say that people have during a, a life of faith is called searching faith, where people ask questions and search for meaning. They, they are not in the stage a different stage is called a kind of a literal interpretation of the Bible and understanding faith, under, perceiving God as very authoritarian. That's one stage. Another stage is, is loyalty to the group. What, what, whatever the group believes, that's what I believe too. Uh, uh, but then there's the stage called searching faith, where examining your thoughts, being willing and open to thinking about things more deeply, uh, developing your own personal sense of faith, not just what the group believes. There's this stage called searching faith. And I think some people are kind of fearful of searching faith kind of stage. But I would say, no, don't be fearful of it. It's good. The questioning, the interaction, understanding the complexities of things. Like I, I describe a lot of things in Christian faith with the phrase, both and. Not either or. Either or means, you know, it's, it's black or it's white. Either it's black or it's white. Either it's light or it's dark. But I would say there are some things in Christian faith we can describe saying it's both and, like this. Like uh, Christian faith encompasses both God's law and God's gospel good news. 
God's law being the, the law, like Ten Commandments, that direct us and guide our lives and give us some boundaries. And the gospel, which is the good news of God's love and forgiveness. So we have both the law and the gospel. Both and. And that's something that you start to learn and understand as you get through this searching faith stage. It's a time when people have doubts and questions and it's okay to bring them up. And I think that helps a person come to a deeper, greater understanding of Christian faith. And so instead of kind of saying doubt is bad, resist doubt, I come to see doubt as part of a faith journey, a normal part, a healthy part. So when someone has doubts like this fellow Thomas, otherwise known as Jude, when people will struggle to understand, to even imagine how wonderful God can be, doubt plays a part in that. Thomas couldn't imagine a resurrection. If we didn't have evidences of the resurrection, how could we even imagine the resurrection? We know, what we know is that people die and they stay dead. Could we, either of us, any of us, imagine the immense quantity of God's love? We think God has love, but it must be a limit. There must be a limit to God's love. Like, there's only a certain amount of people God can love, or a certain amount of time God can love, and then God says, I cut you off. But no, God loves without limits. Unconditional love. Hard to think about, hard to imagine. Can we, can we wrap our mind around the concept of forgiveness? Forgiveness. It's very easy to consider our own sins. To realize the depth of our sins, which are coming in thoughts and words that we say, and things that we do, thought, word, and deed, right? And if we know how much, how often, we ourselves individually sin, it's hard to believe how much God can forgive, let alone not just our sins, but any and all who believe in Him, He forgives. Do you know that sometimes I still have doubts in my ability as a leader, and sometimes I wonder even, why would God consider me? Am I not just one little blip, one little life on a planet of billions, in a history of multiple billions over time? Why would God be interested in me? And so asking these questions, having times of doubt, this is really normal, part of a faith experience. Part of the process of being Christian, I believe, I can even make an argument that doubt is a gift. Doubting is a gift from God because it allows us to ask these questions that open us up to deeper levels of faith. God opens our hearts through that process. And in that process, God drives away fear. He shows us that he is the one who died for our sins, but he also shows us that he is the one that resurrected for new life for us. And he is the risen one. And it says right there, as Jesus encountered those disciples, that he breathed upon them the Holy Spirit. And then he sent them out to do his things, including forgiving those who probably doubt that they can be forgiven. And to announce his forgiveness for them. And when people kind of have their doubts and have their fears and huddle together out of a sense of the need of protection, Jesus is coming there, coming to them, to be with them. Like it or not, I think God is a God who allows doubt and faith to coexist within us. He allows us to see these paradoxes, two things that are very opposite but true at the same time. That God, that Jesus is both human and he is God, both true, both at the same time. That he is uh, with us, he says, but he's also so, so much different than us. He's transcendent. He's above, beyond, and, and outside of this human realm, this earthly realm that we are in. Both true at the same time. It's a paradox. Our doubts, though, if we just 
dive deeply into doubts but never, never experience anything else but the doubts, then we kind of limit God, put God into a box. But you see, you can see that box like the tomb that Jesus blows out the door of the tomb. Stone is rolled away. He's outside the box. What John, the gospel writer, suggests in this encounter that we have today is that Jesus is not finished with you yet. He's not finished with his brother Jude. He's not finished with the rest of the disciples. He's not finished with the more and more people that got to see him. Future generations are all to be held together. To I, I, I will use the word captive to the, the word of God. The one way that Jesus is the one way, the truth, and the life. That he died and lives again. That he rose triumphantly. That God works in us in creative ways. Giving us new possibilities. Helping us to stand in opposition to death and decay. Which is what we would normally think of as the normal way. I want to leave you with this thought. That there is more ultimate faith in a person who strives to be trusting and faithful, but deals with doubt, right? Than the person who never thinks things out and only repeats what they hear others say. I do think it's through times of doubting and questioning that people do get to deeper faith in a sense of trust and faith. Jude experienced doubt and that led him to certainty that Jesus was alive again, that he rose from the dead. And I think that can be us as well. That we reach faith and trust at a deeper level when we struggle through things, when we deal with our questions, not just ignore the questions that we might have. I think it helps us to think things through. And when I spoke earlier about stages of faith, what I was not trying to say, but you might have thought I was saying this, is that that stages of faith happen in sort of an order. Like you go through stage one, two, three, four, five, seven, six, seven. But it's not like that. It's kind of like they're all happening kind of all at once. It's not a real literal, uh, linear kind of way. But they all are happening. They all can happen. Younger students can have questions. Adults can have questions. We can go through times of certainty. We can go through times of, of doubt and struggle. We can stand up with the crowd sometimes, and we can stand up against the crowd sometimes. Thomas said he needed to see in order to have faith. Jude did. But we can say, without seeing, we can still believe and trust that Jesus Christ is risen again, that he is also present and active with us, that he works in the lives of all other believers, that he causes us to do things that are good and acceptable and loving. His work is working in us. To that all God's people can say, Amen. Let's stand and sing.
Let us share this statement of belief, this Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into the heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. I invite that we can pray together. Lord God, we come to you. This second Sunday in the season of Easter, we give you thanks, O Lord, for you have risen. You are reigning as king over us now. We come to your kingdom. We pray that your kingdom comes into us and into this world. We pray that you continue to breathe your Holy Spirit onto your people. Give us strength. Make us bold to share about your resurrection and your forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, you equip your people for ministry with lots of gifts, so many gifts. Pour out upon us the fullness of your gifts, O Lord, and the power to always use them to give you honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, we pray for each one of us. Help us to understand that within us there may be questions and doubts, and that's just okay. It's part of our faith journey. Give us grace. Remind us of your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks, O Lord. It's springtime. Give us patience as we wait for warmer days again. We've had some already. It's now going to be time soon for seed to go into the soil, for sunshine. We give thanks for the rain that we have had. We pray for gardeners and farms and farmers, and above all, for life and growth that comes from your hand. Help us to be good caretakers of this earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, you are the great comforter for those who have great sorrows and grief. Your strength for when we feel weak. O oh Lord, hear our prayers as we pray for those who suffer from illnesses and treatments, recovering from surgeries and injuries, addressing the needs that people have when they're lonely and grieving. O oh Lord, we pray that they can receive your help and your comfort. We take a few moments now to remember and pray for those who need your healing hand upon them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we give you thanks. Would you continue to have us learn to be students all our lives, that we would learn what to believe and what to do. Help us to learn from your Bible, the Word. Help us to be strengthened in faith. Help us to be transformed by your holiness and Holy Spirit upon us. And help us to receive your comfort in this life and even unto our death. And to that all God's people can say, Amen. You may be seated now, and we'll collect the offering.
you're able to. Sisters and brothers, it's important to properly prepare and understand Holy Communion. Holy Communion is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, received under the earthly elements and instituted by Christ himself. The benefit of Holy Communion is pointed out in Christ's words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Through these words, the forgiveness of sin, life, and salvation are given to us in the sacrament. For where there is forgiveness of sin, there is also reconciliation with God and with one another. Let us all come near to God and confess our sin and ask for forgiveness in the name of Jesus. The Lord is merciful and will keep his promise to forgive our sin. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I confess my sins, known and unknown, and my decisions to not follow where you are leading me. I believe that without your mercy, I'm lost. Please wash away all my sins. I ask for your forgiveness. Please, everyone, hear the good news that your sins are forgiven. God sent Jesus to us, and his plan was fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross for all our sins, and then conquered death, giving those who believe in him everlasting life. Jesus continues to call the unbelieving to turn to him and repent and believe while there's still time. Amen to that. Go ahead and be seated and the ushers will uh, have you come forward. We'll have communion at the altar rail if you're able. If you're not able to negotiate steps, that's okay. We'll come out and serve you where you're seated. <laughs> in my thinking ahead, I forgot to do the words of institution. So let me share that with you guys. You're fine. Just be seated or standing wherever you're at. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. He said, When you eat this, remember all that I've done for you. Then again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of your sins. He said, When you drink this, remember all that I've done for you. Now we'll pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for reflecting with me. All right, let's usher them forward.
body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and into everlasting life. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll sing. God's peace, serve the Lord.